Welcome and good afternoon to today's Civil Dialogue. My name is Renee Littleton and I'm the Senior Director of Marketing and Communications and I'm so glad you are able to join us today for another great edition of Arena Civil Dialogues. We are pleased to partner in this wonderful connection and interaction curated and moderated by Professor Amitai Etzioni. The Civil Dialogues are conversations allowing members of the community to engage in civil di di discourse fruitful conversations with one another. So of course, we're gonna have a great conversation today. Just wanna let everyone know that we will have a question and answer session after the dialogue for about 30 minutes. And we'd love for you to join us on camera so that you can ask your question directly to the panelists and get an answer. So without further ado, I'm sure you all no longer wanna hear from me. Let's go directly to Professor Amitai Etzioni and today's civil dialogue of reaching the other, how to dialogue with those with whom we differ greatly Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Renee. Thank you very, very much. It's really I've been a, a, a wonderful uh, partnership with Arena State. Uh, this is our 23rd event. We've been doing this now for four years, but in, in some ways it is the, the most appropriate one and almost I wish we'd done this one first because <laughs> our whole purpose is to ask how can we have civil dialogues? How we can get people together who come from different backgrounds and have uh, different uh, viewpoints. And so in the past meeting, you can find them all uh, on YouTube or also at our inner stage archives. Uh, you'll see that we got people from Trump supporters and Trump opponents talking to each other. Last time we had people very differ very sharply about China having uh, a civil dialogue. So today, as I said, we're gonna have a question, uh, how to do that or how to have how to reach people uh, who deeply uh, uh, differ with each other. Uh, I'm, uh, 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 some days I kind of, uh, I must say, I find the challenge very challenging. And uh, I think about people who believe in all kinds of conspiracy theories, and, and I just can't imagine how any, anybody can uh, uh, believe that. And uh, then uh, I, mindful, I recently read uh, about a nurse from Texas who went to spend three weeks in New York City uh, helping at the height of the COVID crisis. And when she came back to Texas, she could not convince any of her fellow Texans that there was a COVID and they kept saying that was a, some common kind of invention. And I must say, I, I'm on for a moment suggest that uh, people in, on, uh, on the other side are, are all uh, uh, reasonable people who had never hold an opinion I wouldn't like to challenge. And so the question is how to have a, a, a productive uh, conversation. And I just mentioned three little things which came to my mind, and then I am about to get, had to get out of the way and listen. So uh, some people believe in labeling as a great magic, and they think that, for instance, the uh, Republicans got a lot of mileage when they uh, called the, uh, the tax on estates a death tax, and that kind of made people line up against the tax. So I'm not sure many people love a tax before that, but presumably people argue that calling it a death tax had enormous influence. And now Democrats no longer talk about spending money on education, they talk about investing in education, because some people memo went around that uh, that is much more sellable. So that's some people believe in uh, uh, relabeling. Uh, other people believe in narratives, that you tell a story. Uh, and in effect, all our presidential candidates, uh, I always like to tell us a story, how the, either they came from humble beginnings and, and made it, or how they suffered by being rich and were never able to find out what it's like to be poor. They all have their uh, 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 narratives. So that might be one way of uh, getting people. The one which I find particularly uh, interesting and uh, stuck with me is the story I, I think practically all of you have heard about. And that is the story about many, many years ago of a Texas, uh, I'm sorry, a school teacher in Iowa in third grade. And the day Martin Luther King was shot and she gave the class a talk about discrimination uh, and segregation 
and the third year kids that meant absolutely nothing to them. So she created a game in which the kids with blue eyes uh, or blonde hair had to stay in class. They could not go out on a break and they could not speak until spoken to. Uh, and I forgot, she put some other restrictions uh, on them, but the other kids could have all those privileges. And they, they're supposed to be a two day game. But after half a day, the blue eyed kids were so depressed that the teacher felt it was not proper to continue the game. And she stopped it and told them, now you feel, you know what it feels like to be discriminated against. And what impressed me that when NBC collected this class 25 years later, that experience changed all their lives. Every one of those kids somehow got themselves into some kind of international NGO or something like that. So experiences might be another way. And in fact, that's the reason I'm closing on this suggestions. It's a half serious one. I love to take some of the people from Texas who don't believe in the virus and take them to New York, or at the, at the moment, probably to Los Angeles or to Arizona and see if that experience will change their mind. So labeling or narratives or experiences, I'm sure there are other ways. And so the way we're going to do that, we have a tradition of not formally introducing the speakers and asking them to each one to tell us a little about themselves and then tell us how to talk to the other. So Lara, can we start with you, please? Sure, thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to speak about sort of civil dialogue and how important it is for us to hear one another. Um, I am Laura Brown. I serve as the director of the Graduate School of Political Management at the George Washington University. Um, I grew up in California, did undergrad and doctorate at UCLA. I served in the Clinton administration at the US Department of Education. And I can tell you that the one thing I would say is that the first step um, towards sort of creating a civil dialogue, I think, is learning to ask a question. Um, I really believe that we have to ask each other more questions, and then we have to hear answers with our hearts, not our minds. Um, because I think too often we, we fail to see each other's humanity um, when we're kind of engaged and out there. Okay, Camilla, I guess you're next. So um, I too am thrilled to be here and Lara was very nice to meet you um, a little earlier. I'm also a Californian. Um, I am a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, which is based in Washington, DC. It's a policy think tank. And um, most of my work focuses on uh, economic opportunity, uh, racial equity, uh, racial justice. And so when I think about, you know, it, it's actually part of my work and a lot of the work that I've done prior to coming to Brookings has always been about how do you engage people who don't start with the same set of reference points and the same set of assumptions as you do. And, um, you know, what I have found to be effective, and so certainly not the only way to do this, but one of the things that I've found to be effective is to really listen for where people are vulnerable and are scared and build from that and try to, you know, tease that out a little bit. And often there's a lot of um, self-discovery when that happens. And that's a very good place to start a conversation about topics that are sensitive um, or somehow um, more complicated, more and more complicated, and and have and are very polarized, at least you know at, at the moment. So I found that to be helpful, but I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Want to hear everybody else's ideas? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Cynthia. Great. Um, thank you, Camille and Lara. Nice to meet you too. And it's uh, it's wonderful to see Brett again and to be here in this dialogue with Professor Azioni, who's long been a uh, a model for a lot of this work for me in my career. My name is Cynthia Miller Idris. I'm a sociologist by training. I'm a professor of education and sociology at American University. 
where I also run the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab, or PERIL. And in PERIL, we um, spend our days trying to dream up out-of-the-box intervention ideas and then test them to create empirical evidence to show what might prevent um, and intervene in radicalization pathways that would prevent violent extremism. Um, so I've spent the past two decades before I started that lab mostly working in Germany, uh, doing research in German schools and school-based responses to resurgent far-right extremism. And uh, during that work, which was ethnographic and qualitative, I wrote two books and I spent a lot of time interviewing young people who um, were either uh, on the fringes of or actively engaged in or had formerly been engaged in extremist movements and had extremist ideologies. And one thing I'll say is that um, I found both the act of listening to them to be transformative. Um, most of them had, uh, had very isolated lives. Uh, and so one just short anecdote, I remember interviewing one who was who, a young man who was kind of complaining about immigrants. And I said, at one point, well, how many immigrants have you met? And he thought about it for a minute and he said, well, you, right? <laughs> Meaning like I was the only person he actually had ever met um, and yet he was, who was not German and he was complaining about this sort of category. So, um, you know, I've held on to that for a long time. And I'll also say that uh, of the young men I interview who, who have, were in extremist movements and left, every one of them left because of an extended um, long-term engagement cross-culturally with someone whose ideas and opinions and experiences differed from them in significant ways. And over time, the contradictions between their ways of thinking uh, and their experiences, their beliefs and their experiences drew them out. So one person's brother married someone from Vietnam or a teacher who was from Turkey or a variety of different um, experiences. But in every case, that was a constant. And so I think it's really important to think about the value of these experiences of maintaining dialogue, even in extremely isolated times, um, when it's very easy right now in COVID-19 eras to, to be stuck online only with people who agree with us. And I think with that, I'll hand it off to Brett. Hello, everyone. It is really a pleasure to join this conversation today. Uh, and I thank Professor Etzioni for the invitation as well as Arena Stage. My, I'm Brett Steele. I'm the Director of Prevention and National Security for the McCain Institute. Uh, my background in uh, this topic area, in some ways my professional background and my early education are equally relevant. So. I, uh, at the McCain Institute, I'm partnering with the Center for American Progress on a, developing a policy blueprint for countering violent white supremacy in the United States. Uh, I also have a program in universities across the country where university students compete to design and implement programs to prevent hate-based violence. Uh, so doing a lot of work on extremism um, in some ways very similar to that which Cynthia just described. But I'm actually a lawyer and a mediator by training. So before I even went to college, when I was in high school, I was leading living room dialogues and leading um, different uh, anti-hate workshops. And um, so I come at this in two separate uh, directions. My first instinct is to absolutely agree with Laura that questions are so key. Um, and to agree with Cynthia that for all of the former white supremacists that I know, and I know quite a few as the board chair of Life After Hate, um, for nearly all of them, the reason why they chose to leave um, violent white supremacy was experiencing compassion uh, and empathy and that extended engagement with someone who they thought, uh, they, they feared for one reason or another, or they thought they did not deserve that compassion or empathy from. So uh, questions,
questions are really, really important and that engagement is really important. Um, I also think there is value in creating those experiences um, rather than coming at someone with facts and creating an oppositional uh, exchange, rather creating an experience uh, where they can see privilege firsthand uh, without necessarily recognizing that's what's happening at the outset. Uh, those are the types of experiences that I used to facilitate as a high school student. Um, so there, there is value in conversation, value in creating that space for compassion and understanding um, and in creating those experiences as well. And I, with that, I will turn it back over to our model. Well, let me say this, this has been wonderful kind of getting to know you and, and about, but if you're one of the people who listen to this conversation and you're tearing your hair out about X, you cannot convince, give us some examples so you can get a feel. How does it work? I mean, so you just ask them a question then any experience any of you had, I'm sure you meant to just draw and give us some concrete so you can get a feel how that works. Any, anybody? Sure, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start a little bit. Um, so I am doing some uh, work right now, which is focusing on how people use their social relationships to get access to jobs and educational opportunities. And um, we all know just instinctively that whenever we want to change jobs or we're looking for um, some advancement, that we always, you know, reach out to our networks. And um, I'm doing this in some specific cities. And what I found is um, when I talk about, you know, how, well, how do you, how is it that you actually find a job, right? Um, and no matter who this, these people are, they all say, oh, you know, I talk to my friends or I talk to these, you know, whatever. And one of the things that I'm sharing about the research is that um, in places that are really segregated, uh, racially, that actually those networks look very, very different. And um, by starting the conversation where everybody buys into, yeah, I, you know, I hook into my network to get a job, it's a very interesting place to then talk about maybe what are some of those differences in the networks, how they function, um, et cetera. And people start to feel like, oh, okay, so there are some differences. And, you, and I'm approaching it on a subject matter where there's a lot of agreement already, um, but where the differences start to illuminate other kinds of contexts. So I, I found that to be helpful. So, so they understand that they should reach because the networks are segregated, right? And, that's right. Yeah, and, that's right. Did, did they learn to reach beyond the network then? Well, I think the first thing is, is, is surprise. Like, oh, I didn't realize that. You know, so just just getting that information is um, sort of turns around some of their assumptions, and that's actually a good place uh, for people to be because if that's the place where you can actually start to try to build out, you know, what are the potential ways we could change that and get people engaged in that. So yeah, I would jump in on that one to say I agree completely. I think that's a great strategy. And one of the things that I've seen also that particularly with young people works really well. And um, I think it's been done mostly outside of this country or through programs um, that bring kids from overseas to this country, but is now starting to be experimented with, um, with Americans as we become more polarized. And that is the sort of um, programs like the organization Search for Common Ground Runs that bring together young people in um, soccer camps with retreats through the arts with theater programs in uh, something and it doesn't even matter really what it is but some task that brings people together across divides that forces them to collaborate on something and build trust and build relationships with each other and engage in kind of safe dialogue to so they can get to the point where even if they don't agree, um, which may not be the goal, they can engage respectfully and act on the things that they do have in common to forge ahead. And I think as we start to become a society that is every bit as polarized as some places that have had that kind of systemic and ongoing violence um, or the threat of that kind of violence here, 
um, I think we have to look for those kinds of solutions as well that deliberately bring together people across dividing lines to build relationships, to build trust and forge some of those experiences that might help um, with some of the healing actually that has to happen before we can move forward. Let me ask you something because you lived in Germany, you said for six years. Uh, it, it, Germany until uh, 1960s uh, didn't want to talk about the Holocaust. And then they had a major turning about where they got the, the schools and, and even the military to engage in very deep conversations out of it that for decades came a very strong consensus, acknowledging their guilt and committing themselves to teach their children that will never happen again. Now in recent years, they have some uh, 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 fallback and uh, going back to some of that stuff. But do, 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 can you give us any sentence or two about how, how they did it? It was an enormous success uh, mm -hmm. in, in turning around the, uh, German education. Yeah, I think what's happened in Germany, and one of the reasons why I studied it for so long, is because it is such a model for um, for how to how to face reconciliation, how to um, understand the past and the the horrific tragedies of the past. Uh, and yet move forward as a society that is in a way that's constructive. And I think one of the things that Germany did well is, and again, they haven't solved it. They have just as much of a problem of resurgent uh, extremism as, as we do, um, but they have a deeper and wider way of addressing it as part of, um, as part of the protection of democracy more broadly. So if you see extremist ideas and hateful ideas, as, as a threat to democracy itself, then democracy strengthening is a broader task. And so it becomes, it's part of the charge of every school teacher to strengthen democracy. It's part of uh, the efforts of, of all sports teams, of church groups, of theater groups, of arts programs. You have resources in every town to advise people who need um, an assessment or training. Uh, so they're just deeper networks and it's seen as a community problem, as a social problem, and not just as a sort of tumor that can be cut out of society. It's seen as something that is contagious and can spread. And so we have to address that by, you know, through community prevention and not just through um, kind of saying we're going to excise this problem and cut it off to the side. And I think our, in the States, we have tended to think of it as something that's a few bad cells that can be excised instead of realizing that, you know, it's contagious, that extremist ideas and conspiracy theories, I think we're starting to see this now, are contagious and they spread that way and we have to address them as a, as a deeper community-based concern, in my opinion. So maybe I could just jump in here. Um, as the director you know, the Graduate School of Political Management, a lot of what we do is actually teach young people who want to work in politics how to do that work, right? Whether it is campaigning, whether it is serving as a press secretary, working on Capitol Hill, um, they're engaged deeply in both parties um, as staffers and elected officials. And one of the things that I reinforced with our students constantly is just that if you're arguing for a one-party democracy, you're really arguing for a dictatorship. And there has to be an awareness that there needs to be forbearance. And I always argue with the students that at some level, you know, politics gets nasty and it may not always be civil, but you should think of it as having a sense of sportsmanship. So that, you know, if you kind of go out on the field and you, you play it all on the field, you better be able to step off that field and then see the person on the other side. Because that forbearance of your opponent is actually what is so important. There is, I would argue, too much of a desire to want to crush or eliminate or, you know, eradicate the other side. But in fact, doing that just creates an escalation of what I would think are really some of the most negative aspects of kind of the, the partisan combativeness. Um, and this is where, I mean, I'll just say that typically when I bring our students together, I usually ask them when I, when I say, what kinds of questions do you start with? I think you start with really human questions. I think you start with questions about 
You know, what do you love? What do you see the strengths are that you bring to the table? Um, you know, what is important to you and why are you fighting for it? So if you get at people's, I think, underlying um, sort of heart and motivations, I think one of the things that happens is we find that whatever side you're kind of arguing for, these students tend to have a similar desire to want to change the world and make a difference. They just very much see that there are different ways to do that. So I don't, I'm more kind of away from the extremes to a certain degree and more in this vital center where I deeply believe we can learn from each other, um, you know, through these dialogues. So I'll just- you know, Sorry, sorry, Laura. Um, I was just wondering, I know that both Cynthia and Laurie, it sounds like you too, um, work a lot with younger people. And we're getting some questions in right now, which look like, I'm just generally, and maybe Brett, with your background, you're a um, per perfect person to answer this. But you have, you know, fully formed adults. <laughs> yep. Uh, where do we start with them? Well, I, I mean, again, I'm somebody who, I really like asking people questions. I really believe having a sense of curiosity about the other is sort of where this starts. And if you kind of don't understand where people come from, you're not gonna understand sort of who they are now. So I do always like to just ask things like, you know, where did you grow up? You know, who um, was a, a favorite musician when you were growing up? I mean, because one of the things that's so fascinating with people is that cultural touchstones really matter. I mean, I can be in a grocery store and you know, hear like Duran Duran and all of a sudden I'm brought back to the 80s and I start laughing and then I start thinking about it. And then I think, why was that important to me? And at this level, this is where I, I really do think there are many more commonalities than there are differences. I mean, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people across political aisles um, of everyone who's about my age, right? So I'm, I'm 50 and I'm very much in Gen X and the conversation about MTV is one of the most interesting conversations for people of my age range because MTV was the very first, I would argue, social cultural platform that brought us all together across the country. Um, being exposed to different kinds of music and different sorts of um, ideas. So, so this is where I think sometimes you don't want to start with the tough stuff. Start with the fun stuff. Start with the stuff that makes us all laugh. You know, your favorite food, your um, favorite movies. You know, who did you idolize? Um, I I find that we can find commonalities there that then allow us to dig deeper over time. One of the core commonalities for adults, um, as Laura was suggesting questions earlier that came to my mind is, what future do you want for your children? Um, you know, most parents want their children to feel safe. Want them to feel, and you can probe what the different values look like. Um, but there are a lot of commonalities in some of the core um, kitchen table issues, for lack of a better term, uh, in terms of creating that sense of safety, creating that access to education, what that looks like, um, and what needs to change to get there. Um, but there's fun stuff and there's also some of those core fundamentals um, that if you're a parent can cut through uh, some of the more polarizing issues as well. But do we have any examples where somebody took people who are uh, whatever extreme on whatever dimension you want, uh, they came back from the Middle East or they came back from Moscow or whatever, or, or from Texas, and uh, we convinced them to see the light. Uh, anybody did? 
So I'll say that, you know, when it, on, on the extremism side, when it comes to de-radicalization, I would call that, where someone is holding extremist beliefs and, and uh, we're hoping to de-radicalize them, what all the evidence shows is that that's extraordinarily difficult to do until someone's ready to come out of an extremist movement. But then when they are ready to come out, they need mental health supports, they need all kinds of job training supports, reintegration supports. Uh, so de-radicalization programs do need to exist in order to do that. But it's very hard to move someone once they're already deeply involved um, into that, other than continuing to keep the channels of communication open, continuing to present them with alternative views um, in, in hoping that in the long run that kind of creates those openings for them to be willing to come out and start to have the doubts that we know lead to the chinks in the armor that can help them um, disengage. But what is really effective, at least what we believe is to be more effective, I should say, we're testing a lot of this in our lab right now, are really early inoculation, um, you know, uh, interventions where you're preventing people or creating early path, you know, exit pathways off ramps to radicalization. So introducing ideas early on as they're exposed before they're exposed in order to try to inoculate them against some of the manipulation or the propaganda. Um, and I wanna just, while I'm saying this also, I'd love to throw something out to everybody else because I feel like we're all in such agreement about some of this that it might be interesting to, to raise a point where we might disagree, which is um, that I also think there's a limit and I wonder if you do too, to uh, there are lines that I draw with pe people I will not dialogue with. And so even when I got this invitation as Professor Azioni knows, I asked who else would be there because sometimes I am asked to debate extremists um, and I am asked to debate someone who is still an active member of a white supremacist group. And that's happened several times. And, I won't do that because I think that's a harmful platform. And so um, not everyone agrees with that. And I know that that's, you know, that some people believe that actually debating someone um, and that that is on, on social media, that's a, a frequent, there are debates, there are debates in servers on Discord where people will engage in these debates and they have been said to be effective at showing people who are on the fence, you know, at convincing them to come out. I disagree. And so I would love to know you know, do others find that there's a line that they that they line in the sand that they think where dialogue stops being effective? So um, I will answer that, but I also uh, want I want to ask a question of my of my own that I hope my fellow panelists will also answer. So uh, Cynthia, for me, um, I think where the dialogue becomes when it becomes disrespectful or a person has a habit of being disrespectful. That's, that's probably not a person I'm going to be um, eager to engage with uh, on any topic, topic, you know, and certainly not one that's fraught. Um, but I would, I'm, I'm just kind of looking at some of the questions we're getting here. And, um, you know, right now we're at a sort of, uh, in the moment of a um, national conversation around uh, race, race, uh, race relations and um, racial injustices. And one of our um, uh, audience members is talking about the way in which the Confederacy has been venerated over, you know, more than a hundred years, and whether there is an opening for dialogue there. Is that something that um, is a little bit more deep seated and therefore more difficult because we're not like Germany and we don't sort of say we don't have that level of self awareness in a sense um, and intentionality. And I think that thing, that also about these discussions around racism, are we, are we developing that self-awareness? Are we there yet where we can actually uh, start to explore different assumptions and different reference points? Just love to get your, uh, everybody's views on that. I'm afraid I won't be able to resist to jump in there for a moment because sure. I studied just that question. So I, I, I uh, in the days I still used to uh, uh, teach a lot, uh, young people always ask me the question, so uh, how you change people, how do you have a major impact? And I used to answer that, that it's, from all the questions I get in class, it's the easiest question I, I ever got because there's only one answer. And the only one answer, the way to change people's mind on a large scale is to start to join a social movement. 
And so if you think for a moment what's happening now with uh, Black Lives Matter, it's really a modern example of how you change people's mind. If you have seen over the last uh, weeks a 20-30% shift uh, in public opinion, which as we all agree, I think is a very important uh, example. But even more uh, a telling example for me is uh, President Clinton uh, signed the Defense of Marriage Act, which defined marriage between a man and a woman. Uh, and 19 years later, later at the conservative Supreme Court, declared that uh, marriage uh, of the same gender uh, is uh, illegal. So for 19 years, we moved from a liberal Democrat, or at least centrist Democrat, uh, disallowing uh, uh, gay marriages to a conservative. What happened over these 19 years? That is the same thing happening now with race, the same thing that happened with the environment, the same thing that happened with women's rights, with um, um, the Me Too movement and such. What they all have in common is very clearly, they start with somebody putting up a thesis. Like Betty Friedan's book uh, on, on feminine mystique, Rachel Carlson's book, Sun and Spring, Martin Luther King's speeches uh, about civil rights, they start with a brief. That's the moral case. Then it gets dramatized in the streets. And, and that what is the central part in our televised society. You, you want to have an effect, it's not going to happen through op -eds. It happens by blocking the, the traffic, by the suffragettes tying themselves to the fence of the parliament. Uh, these are all dramatization acts and they then trigger what I call a billion hour buzz. Because suddenly everybody's talking about that. And out of that, uh, surprisingly often, nine times out of 10, it's a surprisingly high number, but check me, new shared moral understanding arise, which not only we reach to a consensus, never 100%, but enough uh, of a consensus, but it translates to new laws. So it's not, a, it's made Nixon create the Environmental Protection Agency. The environmental movement was that strong. So uh, I'm sorry for interrupting here, cutting in, but uh, I think if you want to do it on large scale, uh, you need a, a, a major social movement. The moment we have one on racial issues, uh, I think we need one on, on where this country is going. And that goes back to Laura's point, uh, uh, how we save democracy uh, how, how we attend to structural changes. And I think we are, we are there. Now, last, it's, we talk about people, what the economists call at the margin. We're not going to get everybody, but I think morally we're required to address everybody. I don't think we should call anybody deplorable. I don't think we should leave anybody else. Everybody should be invited in. Sorry for taking your time. Please, uh, I'm stay out now. Be quiet till, till sunsets. Oh, no, you're fine. Um, I mean, I'll just say that I want to see if I can address some of the, the comments that are coming in in the chat box. Um, so this one example from Andrew about, um, you know, a woman saying to a man, you have to be quiet now. You can't understand this because you're a man. So I deeply believe that that kind of language actually prevents any sort of dialogue. I think it's vitally important if somebody says you can't understand because of X, Y, and Z, the response should be help me understand. Try to help me understand what is so real and so pervasive to you because I want to be here. I want to hear it. I want to empathize and sympathize. And the other thing that I would just say is it is true that I don't think that you can start a dialogue from a place of confrontation. I believe that you have to build relationship and it's only in relationship and with trust can we all get to a place where we're more vulnerable with each other. I mean, I will tell you, I'm somebody who um, is generally incredibly vulnerable about my past life, you know, everything that I've done over the course of my life, 
you know, I, I'm always telling students, yeah, I have a great memory because I never did drugs. And I'm really proud of that, you know? And I, I don't sort of shy away from telling people about some of the more personal aspects of my life. And I also think that my vulnerability frees up another person to also feel a greater sense of trust and vulnerability too. So you can't just kind of ask questions and put somebody kind of on the witness stand, you have to be willing to give to the dialogue too um, with your heart, with your experience, and with a tremendous amount of patience, um, which is probably the hardest, at least for me. Um, it's hard for me to be patient. I'm not gonna take the floor, it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I will jump in on the Confederate flag issue. I think that's going to come up later, but just to respond to um, Camille's question about it, I think, you know, this, this happens, we get, I get calls sometimes from principals um, who are struggling with this issue about kids wearing the Confederate flag hat to school in a school that's um, where there's not even a potential claim, like nowhere near the South uh, that is where there's no claim of heritage. There's no claim of, um, uh, of Southern history or, or related to the Civil War or the family's history that way. And so uh, we do spend a lot of time talking about the power of symbols and how symbols are used and, and misused. And one of the things that I think is really important is to, is to talk to people, again, if you're talking about somebody coming to a school or a classroom, to find out what they think the symbol means and one of the and, and if they understand how it's read by others. So that's, I think, a good one about the Confederate flag, but it's also true um, in Germany where there are all kinds of symbols uh, that are banned, but then when the symbols themselves get banned, they just get transformed into a different symbol. And so instead of, you know, using the letters of the alphabet to refer to Hitler, they turn it into a formula that is, uh, you know, so there's different kinds of codes that get used and displayed. And so in general, my view is that banning itself just fuels the kind of game playing culture um, and it's better to interrogate and to find out what is it? Is this an act of rebellion? Is it a is it an act of provocation? A lot of times, I think there's a, a desire to be provocative if we're talking about youth in particular. Um, so, what are they getting out of it exactly? Is it a deliberately racist act, or is it just um, some someone trying to provoke and trying to uh, lash out against the mainstream or against adults in their in their lives? And what is it that they want to accomplish by doing it? And sometimes that can de-escalate that situation, but um, I have lots of other thoughts on it, but I wanna make sure not to uh, ramble on too much and, and let others have a say as well. Let, let me hear from the rest of you what you think about that question, about focusing on symbols. Uh, is the argument that it just, just takes you away from the real issues? Uh, is it really important to remove monuments while we have different death, death rates between minorities and uh, and uh, white populations. So sh sh should we encourage people uh, not to focus on symbols, but focus on the most structural issues, I'm asking. So I'll say this. I mean, I, I think that symbols are important, but I think that those who are claiming kind of that the, that the issues will be resolved when all of these statues are gone, um, are sort of missing the point. I mean, there is a place where I've been looking at, at things with the Black Lives Matters movement um, and saying to myself, okay, now's the time to organize. Now's the time to run for office. Now's the time to lobby legislatures. Now's the time to actually really work to change some of those substantive issues. Um, because I do think that the public has been moved there has been a sea change in where we are. And it does seem to me that kind of we can stay in this place of focusing on the symbol and the protest, or we can, you know, really start advancing the legislation that will also make substantive changes. And I'm not saying that these two things are mutually exclusive, but I worry that the energy will be lost if the legislation is not realized quickly. 
Anybody else? Yeah, I'll, I'll say something about um, uh, symbols versus other kinds of change. So I actually think you probably need to do both. Um, and the reason I say that is that symbols are not, they're not just, um, they're, not sim they're not simply symbols, but they also um, crystallize what is uh, a sense of cultural norms and conventions and values. Um, there is some very interesting research um, that is done uh, that was done by an economist um, at uh, the Economic Policy Institute, which shows that in uh, in the South, the uh, southern parts of the United States, where you have streets that are named after Confederate heroes, et cetera, and you have a lot of statues for Confederate heroes, you also have much lower voting, um, uh, African Americans, lower uh, health outcomes, um, a range of other other sort of uh, real world consequences. So I think what that does demonstrate is that in those places where you had the kind of political power to be able to erect those symbols, you also had the political power to do other things. And so those symbols are actually symbols of political power. And so removing them is important, uh, and as is interrogating the political power that allowed them to be placed there. I, I think that the engaging people in the decision, I think is an important part of that story. I reminded that uh, San Francisco for a while was worried that they're gonna become like Manhattan, with a very high rise skyline. And so they uh, put, uh, told the, uh, the citizens of San Francisco that there's going to be six months later a, a referendum which will be decisive. The referendum will make the decision whether they will allow high rise buildings or not. And over those six months, I, I, that's when I was spending my time at Berkeley, uh, uh, most people in San Francisco became world experts on high-rise buildings and all the issues involved because they knew that six months later their vote will really make a difference. So I think if you engage people in a decision but give them a sense, I, I hate it for empowerment, that uh, it'll make a difference. They're not just uh, going to fill out a questionnaire. And then I think they're willing to kneel in there and get information. But you really have to open them the opportunity to participate in the decision making. But we never answered the Cynthia's question if you're going to refuse some people to stage. So uh, uh, here's your chance. So I don't want her to go home and say, we, we, we left one question unanswered. So will you allow an extremist on the stage to dialogue with you? Better? Mm -hmm. This is a tricky question that comes up a lot uh, <laughs> for people in my circle, in Cynthia's circles. And I think for me, um, the stage is the hard part. So to have a one-on-one -on -one dialogue where we can genuinely ask questions and seek to understand uh, where they're coming from um, and perhaps use some motivational interviewing techniques to move the needle. Uh, that's a lot different um, than uh, providing a platform where they could perhaps reach more people. Um, and so for me, the one-on-one -on -one dialogue is very much welcome. The, depending on how the conversation is structured the uh, public, especially if it's structured as a confrontation rather than a conversation, I think is not particularly uh, helpful and potentially uh, quite harmful. So I am much more inclined to have that as a one-on-one -on -one conversation rather than a public conversation. The other place where I sometimes draw the line is if I feel that people have historically operated in bad faith, where there, there is a history of not acknowledging 
um, facts, not acknowledging um, kind of broader conversation uh, and twisting things in a way that is not a constructive conversation. And so that that's another line that I've sometimes drawn where again, you can have that constructive conversation one-on-one, -on -one, but providing a broader platform for that is more problematic. I don't want to put in a spot, but you sounded just a moment ago like Tom Friedman and Elizabeth Drew and Amita Etzioni, who argued that you cannot debate with a consummate liar. And that if somebody keeps making up facts, you cannot have productive debate with them. And therefore there should be no presidential debates this year. Well, it, I mean, I'll just say it is really hard when somebody is operating off of, you know, alternate facts. Um, I mean, you have to start from a place of some agreement around the state of play, if you will. Um, but I agree completely with Brett that the, the stage is the problem because the stage creates a performative aspect right? People are, if you will, on their game and invested in their ego reputation. And that then ends up becoming an unproductive dialogue because no one is going to move off of that place that is so kind of ego um, driven. And so this is where I agree completely. The conversations that that I've had that have been productive where I've learned and somebody else has also learned have been more private, more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I mean, they've been places where vulnerability can exist, you know, where if one person or another, myself included, starts crying, that's not kind of verboten or a sign that you are um, kind of not up to the task. It's actually, a sign of real connection. We are about to bring in other people who want to ask questions, but it's your last chance to. I don't want to deprive anybody. Yeah, I would just I would just add that I think uh, on that last point, you know, I uh, I think to me it's it's I agree with everything that everyone said, and but it's it's not just about the performative aspect, but about the legitimizing aspect of mm. giving people a platform, and I think that. Um, uh, that that thinking about where we draw the line with what kinds of ideas, even if they're not lies, are dangerous to democratic society and are outside of the bounds of what we should consider acceptable discourse. And so I think about um, white supremacists advocating for a white ethno state because they believe that demographic change, which will result in a eventually a white minority in this country is a threat to, to whites, right? And so it's not that there's factual error necessarily in the sense of demographic change. Um, there's some rooted in reality there, but it's, but it's the positioning of it as threat. And so, and platforming a person who makes those arguments in creating a debate about the nature of that, of that um, demographic data as a threat uh, gets into a lot of conspiracy theories. And I think where, where the media sometimes gets this wrong and where events, you know, like that I've been invited to debate um, someone who, you know, it just, it, it positions those two, those two arguments as if they're equal, right? As if they're kind of just as legitimate as each other in the interest of dialogue. And I think that is actually a dangerous position. So it's, it's performance, but also legitimation. And I think we have to watch out for that. And sometimes in the name of dialogue, that type of mistake gets made. And we face that issue now on Facebook, Twitter, and, and Google, uh, because they have been delegated now to decide who gets the platform or not. And, and I'm not completely comfortable with the idea that Mark Zuckerberg and uh, uh, his associates will decide who has the right to speak and who doesn't. Uh, and so, on the other hand, our elective officials seem to shy away from their duty. So uh, uh, this issue, who gets the platform and who should be ruled out to save democracy uh, is, is very, very much with us. And so uh, why we now turn to our audience who have been patiently waiting and with the help of, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. 
Oh, I was just going to respond to Camille, if I can take a moment to do yes, that. Yes, we, we got to Cynthia's question, but didn't fully address Camille's. Uh, in terms of, are, are we at the point now to have a constructive racial, racial justice conversation in this country is what I understood your question to be, Camille. Uh, I think we are at the point where there is a broader opening than there has been in decades. Uh, but to Laura's point, it's a question of what we do with that opening uh, and to not take for granted that people's voice support for Black Lives Matter actually translates into a fundamental understanding of privilege or a willingness to deconstruct that privilege. Uh, and so I think there is a greater opening to the conversation, uh, but we need to put genuine work into that conversation. Um, and that, uh, to Professor Etzioni's point, yes, needs to be national and needs to be movement driven, but it also needs to be personal. Um, because some of those most constructive conversations happen at an individual level um, and not just a national level. So opening, uh, but I don't want to take it for granted. Well, it's, but tell us what is the work you're going to put in there? You said, we need, I agree with you, we need to put work in there. So what is it? I do not want to pretend to be the expert on all of the work that needs to go into that. So <laughs> I want to invite all of our panelists to answer that question. Uh, one of the efforts uh, we were doing here uh, locally in Southern California before COVID uh, was bringing back the tradition of living room dialogues, um, having these conversations at the local level um, and truly building that consensus and broader understanding, um, doing those experience exercises to get that personal experience uh, like we talked about at the outset of this conversation at the local level, um, as well as the broader uh, policy framework which is part of what I'm trying to build with the Center for American Progress, but those are just two small drops in the bucket. Uh, and frankly, every individual and every organization has a contribution to make. Uh, this isn't anything that any one organization can do alone. So I open it up to others about what can we do. Uh, you, you, you get the last me. word. No, I just wanna, I wanna thank Brett very much for that. I do agree we are at an opening, but and, and agreed an opening is just that, an opening. But to Lara's point, I think we do have to um, exploit that as much as possible and really move as quickly as possible to build on the social movements that Professor Azioni has mentioned and to use some of the techniques that um, you know all of you use, which is where we think about the place where we are most um, likely to meet each other and it could be the fun stuff, it could be the vulnerable stuff, but where is that? And that's where we should start. Uh, thank you. Well, I, my technical co-host with you, bring in the first question then, please. We'll be still learning how to do that. Uh, welcome, thank you. Oh, we just had you read. Thank you. Uh, please take the, uh, the floor is all yours. Okay, um, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. I'm Valerie Johnson. I'm Associate Professor of Political Science at DePaul University, and I teach courses on race and class. And so needless to say, I eat, sleep, <laughs> and drink all of this stuff every single day, every hour of the day. And I am in this moment really interested in how we can engage people. But I look at where we are, 155 years after slavery. And here we are saying, oh, I think there's an opening. I think there is an opportunity. And it's like, there's been so many opportunities over the last 155 years, and we haven't really gotten there. And I think it's because we haven't established any fundamental American values that we actually live, right? And so, you know, I'm mindful that 64% of uh, Americans are non-Hispanic whites. And so I think it is incumbent, if you're talking about race issues, and obviously there's a 
plethora of issues, be it homophobia, classism, dis, you know, um, you know, all, all sorts of isms. But if you're, if you're talking about racism, it seems that we have to depend on white people coming to some consensus that certain things are not tolerated. I'm mindful that in Germany, uh, they have free speech, you know, in their constitution, just like we do. But there are still sort of acceptable boundaries of discourse. And so there, in America, there doesn't seem to be any acceptable boundaries. That's why in the, in the question and answer section, you know, I was saying that, you know, in, in this society until very recently, you know, the Confederacy was venerated. I mean, how is that acceptable? I do a study abroad in Germany, in Berlin, and it's on history, memory, and the law. And I was struck in, I think it was 17, when we came, you know, we, we left Germany and there were students who were actually arrested, uh, not our students, but some students who were arrested for doing the Heil Hitler sign in front of the Buddha staff. We came back to Charlottesville, you know? And so here we are over there, you know, and we're talking about America, blah, blah, blah. And we come back and it's like, well, damn, they were very intentional. They under, it's like, here's the line. So I'm just trying to figure out how can we draw that line, that societal line where engagement can even take place. It's a very, very good question. Please, should we arrest those who in Charlottesville say Heil Hitler? This is the question we've been asked. Professor Johnson, thank you for that question. Um, I think about this a lot because obviously my work kind of toggles between Germany's banning policies and the US's much more uh, open approach, the uh, completely unfettered approach kind of to, to racist symbols and expressions under free speech. Um, and, you know, what I have come to realize, I think, is that uh, that banning symbols doesn't work if your expressions doesn't work, if your intent is to try to reduce the extremism or the hatred itself, right? All it does, in fact, is in most cases I've seen is backfire. So as I said, when students were wearing, you know, the eighth letter of the alphabet, eight, eight for, for Heil Hitler, the 88 uh, symbol was banned in some of the schools they studied, they started wearing t-shirts that said 100 minus 12 or 87 plus one within a day, right? I mean, the game playing just, um, gets facilitated by that. But the banning does work as making a line in the sand for everybody else. In other words, I think the banning is effective at showing what the rest of society believes, where the norms are, where the values are. This is where, this is the boundaries of acceptable discourse and extremism. So I think, sometimes I think the mistake we make is to think that the bans are to transform extremists in some way. Um, but I think actually those bans are more helpful if we think about them as these are our values. Now, the last thing I'll say about that is I think we often can't ban, um, or it's harder to ban here. And, and one mistake that I think institutions make is that they think that by protecting free speech, they can't also condemn hate speech. And I think we have to think about the ways that we can. You can say, hey, a swastika was stamped in the snow on Cornell's campus as it was last year or the year before, and that's allowed but it goes against everything we believe in as an institution. It's abhorrent. And we stand with our Jewish faculty and community and students as, as the president did in his statement. And that is a far better statement in my opinion than the statement of a university leader in Texas who noted that white supremacist flyers had been removed from campus buildings because um, they, they violated campus policy about adhesives being used on buildings, right? So, um, with no comment about the content of those flyers. And I think, I think we're learning as communities that we have to show what our communities stand for, even if we need to protect free speech while doing that. Very well put. What is legally right doesn't mean it's the right thing to say. Right. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. Please, another question, please. I am not sure whether I'm supposed to go on or not. Yeah, you are. Uh, but, <laughs> but I will. I just wanted to thank you so much for this conversation. It's been absolutely wonderful. And I wanted to offer an example of, of something that my husband and I just watched on television that was amazing because I never thought it was possible. And that is to be able to talk to extremists. 
um, my husband and I uh, saw the movie called The Best of Enemies, uh, which was a film that was made um, apparently last year based on the book uh, by the same title, The Best of Enemies, Race and Redemption in the New South by Osha Gray Davidson, uh, which focused on the conflict between civil rights activists and Atwater, uh, who, who passed away apparently in the 90s, and the Ku Klux Klan leader, C.P. Ellis. And uh, the person that was involved in this rivalry uh, was Bill Riddick, who sets up meetings with both of them, um, you know, folks from the Ku Klux Klan and then folks from the white, uh, from the uh, black community. Uh, and, and the meetings were called Sherrits uh, to discuss segregation and other issues over a period of 10 days. And it was astounding to see the change um, by some of the white folks, but but particularly uh, the head of the Ku Klux Klan. And, and apparently um, we read up on this and apparently many of these sherrods have, have been held in, around the country and they do work. Uh, they do work even with, <laughs> even with extremists, uh, you know, somebody like the head of the, of, of the Ku Klux Klan. So I just wanted to offer that. And I also wanted to say that one of the ways that we uh, have these very difficult conversations among um, people of very different backgrounds, me as a Muslim, um, you know, starting of the organization that I, that I have, Islamic Networks Group, um, to teach about Muslims in Islam. This is after the, the tail end of the first Persian Gulf War and then through 9-11, was to contextualize Islam in the context of religious pluralism, of America, the, the American values of religious pluralism, and speaking alongside Jews, Christians, Hindus, and Buddhists, and it's astounding to me to see the evolution, not only of the speakers on these panels, but also the speakers getting up and defending each other when a Muslim is attacked for not condemning enough for the Jewish speaker to get up and say, Maha, let me speak to that because I know the number of times that Muslims have condemned. Or when someone says something or asks questions that are completely anti-Semitic, not realizing that they are, for me to get up and to be able to speak on those issues as well. So I've seen that happen. And more recently, thanks to the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, which, uh, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm socially conservative. I'm someone who probably, you know, just, <laughs> even though being a person of color, I didn't realize a lot of things about what African-Americans were going through until I began to see these videos. Um, thanks to Black Lives Matter, that begins under the Obama administration, ironically, right? And, um, and so I begin now to contextualize Islamophobia, the anti-Muslim bigotry in the context of anti-Blackness, realizing that, oh my God, as a Muslim American, as an Arab American, I am not gonna overcome racism in this country. It's just being recycled. If my brothers and sisters in the African-American community are still struggling hundreds of years after the end of slavery and decades after the civil rights movement, they're still struggling what the hell is going on and asking that question and realizing that we actually need to work in partnership with African-Americans, with Latinx, with Asian-Americans and others, because this is just being, white supremacy is being recycled in this nation and we're never gonna overcome it if we don't, if we don't address it as as, um, as communities of, of, uh, of non-whites working with white liberals or white progressives or people that, that, that understand this, the history of this nation. Um, and so I just wanted to offer those things as examples. I didn't really have a question, but, but, um, but they wanted me to participate in this conversation uh, by, yeah, by offering uh, Thank you. Thank you, very helpful contribution. Thank you very much. Thank so you. maybe there's one thing I could just offer. Um, I would say that you know, the most important thing, I think, is actually teaching history. I mean, I'll be, I'll be quite frank. I, I don't think that we fully appreciate that we are still coming out of feudalism. And when I say that, I mean that we have to understand that the moment that we are in right now actually started with the Magna Carta. And yes, it's no surprise to me that it started with sort of all men are created equal because that was actually radical at that time because those men weren't of noble birth. 
And then we got to a place where, yes, maybe women, maybe first black men, then eventually African Americans as a whole. I mean, when I look at this, I know it feels forever, right? Because we're talking, you know, really 400, 500 years since we have begun this path. But I also think if you have a, a context of human history, human history is actually the history of war conquering and essentially might makes right. So in some ways, what we are doing is absolutely extraordinary. And I just think every generation is opening up and realizing more what it really means to have um, sort of natural rights endowed by our creator, right? Which means that all of us are equal. We have nowhere near the ability, I think, to sort of process that at the, at the human level. And I think that that's our problem, right? The theory makes sense. The reality is incredibly difficult because for the reality to be realized, we all have to have acceptance of the other. And acceptance of the other has never been the way of the human species since it was actually you know and came out of sort of evolution so i mean this is what i mean about I, I i think as hard as where we are is and you sit here and you think are you kidding 1619 the first slave ship there's also this extraordinary moment where you also can step back and say wait a minute you know when this country was founded 100 percent of the founders were racist. Okay, now we've maybe gotten to the place where the majority, even if they are sort of unconsciously biased or have systemic prejudices that are reenacted daily, we have many more people who don't want to be than we have ever had before. And that's kind of extraordinary. All right. Um, we have more, so, more questions, but it's extremely well taken. So all I'm going to add to that, it's time to accelerate history. Yes. So we don't have to wait another 1,200 years. No, uh, but, I, it's, but can it's, can it I is. Just say, can I say something about, doc, just a comment about Dr. Brown? I think we also need to recognize that it didn't just start in 1619, but the period of colonialism, the, the, the construction of race, the construction of racialization, the racial hierarchy, the creation of white supremacy, those are very modern things that need to be addressed. I, I, I don't think that we've always been racist. I, I definitely you know, believe that uh, we, uh, we've always conquered each other, but it wasn't based on the color of somebody's skin. Where would you categorize me in a different light? I would actually look white, although I'm not white. I'm, I'm Semitic. I'm, 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 a, I'm a Semite. I'm an Arab, right? Um, the, the idea of race and racism and, and the creation of white supremacist system, and I, that's the history that I think we need to address, which is modern. It's not modern meaning in, 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 the, in the colonial period, as you, you know, you're all professors, in the 17, 1800s which then becomes institutionalized in the United States and in, in various ways, affecting mostly black Americans in this country. And I see it, now I see it as an adult, as a Muslim thinking, oh, I have you know, a PhD or I have a graduate degree. I graduated from Stanford. My, my, all my, my, whole, my entire family are all physicians. I can still be racially profiled, just like President Obama continued, you know, it's, can, still, can be, still be racially profiled. That's the conversation that we need to have. How did we get here? And it, and it really gets, white supremacy gets institutionalized in the United States and it begins with African-Americans. And we need, to, we need to tackle this head on. We can't be shy about it. I, I need to tell you, I don't know how good your Arabic is, but shukra. So let me thank you for your uh, contribution. And I, I just like to keep, uh, give other people a chance. And if everybody take a little less uh, time, we get more uh, people in to answer ask and answer questions. Uh, Ali, please. 
Hi, thank you. I, I'm really outclassed here. So I'm so below the level of all these great thinkers and I'm happy to be here and this is a privilege. I'm sort of, my head was just wandering all over the place. So I typed the question, how people believe the truth and reconciliation hearings. You know, if you watch the documentary Long Day's Journey into the Night, it's just so empowering and, and um, you know, just to see the greediness of the personal level, yet it was on a grand mass scale in a public view. So they managed to achieve those two together. Um, I, I, as my head wandered, I'm also just thinking of my individual life and this, this idea that we will never reach past the impasse until we literally are each other's neighbors and we're in our school districts together and our children have a shared emotional connection and experience and I don't know how to get there in this world. I think about the injustices in our education systems and the what I think is a more segregated world even than my experience. And then I work at a university and I facilitate a course that has been introduced at the first year level, but it feels very mandatory and imposed and it doesn't feel designed by the voices who have been oppressed. I don't know what your thoughts are about all that stuff. How do we get the voices of the oppressed alongside the voices of the privileged? I see you as a human. The, the bird watching incident in Central Park pained me because the nation immediately made worth of this person's educational background, this justification that the violation was even more egregious because of his value, you know, his educational credentials and all that kind of stuff pissed me off because he's a human being and that's all that should matter. So I guess that's my wandering in this inspirational webinar. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Let, let's take one more, please. Uh, Jay, would you please? Thanks so much for the opportunity. It's been a really, really wonderful talk so far. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about the question of urgency. Um, obviously every oppression or every person that's kept down, there's a moral urgency to lift that person up because you know they only have one life to live. However, recently we've seen things that transcend any of that even, like if you look at global warming, right? If we do not, the science is very clear, if we do not act on global warming now and aggressively, everybody, like billions of people are going to suffer and suffer badly, right? Um, and, and when you have people out there that are just like, no, it's not real. No, there are things that are more important. No, it's unsolvable. Um, how, all of the techniques that you've been talking about are, are, are viable, like wonderful techniques that I, I, I'm going to try to employ myself. But how do we handle the fact that we just don't have time on, on particularly global warming? Well, that's a very good question. So again, uh, the question of facing complicated questions uh, is, uh, where the effect is uh, over a long stretch of time. Uh, how do we deal with that? You know, I want to jump in here just for a second and a, kind of a class of questions um, around uh, how do you engage people who can who have a back door and don't have to engage? I mean, essentially. Um, and uh, I find that, I mean, uh, to me, that is sort of the crux of a lot of the issues around, um, you know, racial equity. It's like there, somebody always has a back door. They don't really need to engage. There are people who just don't need to engage, right? Um, and I think when we, you know, uh, reflecting on Allie's question a little bit earlier about the Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission, I think there was a sense that you had to engage, that there wasn't really a back door. Um, so we need to be able to create that. And Jay, to your, your point about climate change, I think we're getting to the point where there isn't going to be a backdoor. Um, and, uh, you know, yes, if you look at the, the moment where we are in right now, there are people who are denying the science, et cetera. But with you know, 130 degrees in California, lots of uh, forest fires, et cetera, um, all kinds of, of other sorts of environmental changes, which are, 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 you know, are going to have uh, major economic consequences as, as well as human consequences, we are not going to have a backdoor fairly quickly. But on racism, we have a backdoor, and that's a problem. Okay. 
Um, and anybody else? All right. I. I'm not I mean, I'll just I'll just say I think right. All of this comes down to act locally, think globally. I mean, I do believe we each have to commit to living what we want um, to happen to actually really happen. I mean, it's very easy to stay kind of in our ivory towers and talk. And I do think we have to try to live it. We have to try to do it. We have to work to engage with people um, personally and, you know, every day. I mean, I tell my students, don't walk around this city with earbuds in. You won't have any conversations. And so the truth of the matter is, I really believe you should talk to people when you're in line at the grocery store. You should talk to people when you're taking a cab. You should talk to people um, as often as possible and in as many different venues as you can. I want to, I want to tie back a couple themes. Um, the, the early question about banning in Germany and how do you create that kind of normative salience and the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission point, um, it, it's not so much about the ban, it's about getting the societal consensus that allows you to get any legislation. It's that process of building that consensus as a society um, and building legislation toward a better future. But it, really needs, Camille's point about a backdoor is so salient because people will avoid this topic. They have for generations. Um, and so how do you align issues? If we look at global warming, there is going to be a racial justice component to global warming. There already is. Um, so where are the issues where there isn't a backdoor, where there is some commonality of experience, um, and then having that rich conscious remedy on top of it. Um, where, where can you align some of those points as we look toward that kind of greater conversation of reconciliation? Okay, let me just add, I think the environment is so late that at the moment the only thing which can save us is a major technological break. So the especially in carbon capture. And this will have to come as well as legislative process. But let's go to our next question. Dan Avon, you are on. Please. And it's relevant to my question. I chair the Department of Political Science over there, over here. And um, I'm really puzzled about uh, a change in political civilism in the United States that I find relevant to many comments I heard from the panelists. Thank you all. Very interesting. No time to go beyond that. With thanks. And my question is this. There's the issue of the Confederate heroes as symbols that are now being attacked. And there's even an attack on a symbol such as Woodrow Wilson, who had a complex career. He's associated during this specific year with loading his cabinet with racist, I don't know, cohort. And, but he's also had done a lot of positive things in world history and there's a lot to be said in his favor. Now, political symbolism. Political symbolism puts communities together. And I wonder what happens in the United States when instead of the complexity you're talking about, many of you address that, and they should have seen the other. Where do you draw the line where you say, with all due respect, Mr. or Mrs. Other, I will not have your General Lee in the public sphere. I won't have your Woodrow Wilson in the general sphere because I'm concerned about racism and it trumps any other symbolism. And I will conclude. So first of all, where do you draw the line? It seems to be going against everything I've heard from all of you. And number two, a question. Why not, instead of removing these symbols, why not turning them into educational opportunities? Like keeping them there and saying, look, during that period, like someone here mentioned, one of the previous commentators, 
Yeah. Good question. Good question. Let's take another question. Please stay. Please stay with us. Uh, and Roger, Roger here. Did you ask the next question, please? Can you unmute yourself? <laughs> We're still learning how to zoom. Roger, <clears throat> you're, you're still muted. Welcome, please ask your question. You need to unmute yourself. Roger, you need to unmute yourself either on your phone or on the computer. There, is that good? Uh, yeah, somebody knows the business. <laughs> I think I'm unmuted. Can, can you, everyone hear me? Yes, very yes. well. So I've been engaged with uh, various aspects of dialogue for maybe about 50 years. And so there are two questions which come out of human history, which always disturb me. The first question is, first of all, education has, for, by and large, as we know it, from the turn of the 20th century on, been about what is this? And been denying the notion of asking us questions about who am I? Those two profound inquiries have been even avoided by this panel, not about who am I and what my interests are? And dialogue, Socrates suggested, is to ask questions about oneself, is to ask, to engage in an inquiry about the nature of my own identity and what I hold is true and whether those things that are true are transcended, whether or not I can grow out of where I am now to become who I should be next. The notion of a human transcendence is critical to dialogue, that we can change. If we cannot change, we will regain ourselves back in the fifth century or whatever. So I ask the question now carefully of this panel. Who am I? Why do I believe these things? Why do I hold on to race when I am a human being? Race is a fiction. The notion of who I am as a human being is what's critical. And if you and I transcend the notion of the color of our skin or our gender or our wealth or any of these things, how can we be a part of a community? How can we be this crown of creation called humanity? That has been avoided by everyone at this panel so far. Well, it's uh, not about those things, but about what it means to be a human being. All right, that, these are hefty questions. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm not sure that we have about four minutes left, actually three. Uh, so uh, I'm giving each panelist a chance to answer a very profound question and the question of uh, Dr. Amon. And then uh, we have about one minute each, please. Uh, when we start uh, with you, Camille. Okay, so uh, Jose, I think I understood you to say that we were not addressing the question of where we want to go. Is that correct? No, where no. We... It is the question of who am I? Who am I? Okay. Each, that's, that's what dialogue is about. Right. It is about inquiring into my own identity. Sorry. Please, please go ahead. <laughs> okay, so, so I just want to make sure I understood the question. So, you know, when I think about that question, I think about myself as being a product of my family are immigrants from the Caribbean, so a product of that, um, a product of the places I've been and lived uh, all over the world, a product of uh, the, you know, the United States um, as it has been from the 1960s until now. I'm, I'm also a mom uh, and I'm a, a sister, an aunt, et cetera. Um, and so when I think about who I am relative to some of the questions that have been asked here, I am still a person who is deeply engaged and wanting to grow. And, uh, and so I, you know, I always try to extend that same set of assumptions to people that I engage with. Um, Dan, with respect to your question, I'm just going to be super brief, but I really, um, you know, I think this is a good moment for us to be thinking about who we hold up as heroes and who we do not. And I like this kind of inter introspective um, moment that we're in. And um, if some people happen to fall as heroes, I think that that's actually, that's actually okay. Uh, half a minute left, uh, better. <laughs> So I'll just jump in here and say that I actually think it is profound to get to a place where we can see our common humanity. But I think we cannot ignore 
that we are each embodied. And within our bodies, there is also a reaction from the world to our bodies. So that embodiedness is absolutely interwoven with our humanity. And, you know, people see me and they say, you're a white woman. Okay, well, yes. And I'm also, you know, six nationalities, a whole different wave of immigrants in the United States, and my family had three religions. Um, you can imagine it, it's been an interesting life. Um, but that sense of being embodied is important to the who am I and how you get to that humanity. Because I actually agree with you that I'm hopeful that we can move beyond our identities to the places where we do have common humanities. I need to stop you here. Alone. I need, I need to apologize. Sure, no, so sorry. I apologize to everybody too people who wanted to ask more questions to us, the panelists. I would love to, con to continue, but uh, in a moment the lights got to go off. So, <laughs> so before I thank you, uh, I just got to take uh, one second to introduce you to what's going to happen next. And again, I need the help from my colleagues behind the screen there to get us to the next page for a moment. So uh, we, we're going to be talking uh, uh, next month on uh, uh, Save the children. How we can? Uh, what are the alternatives? Uh, it, we can uh, help if it's school, childcare. Pause. Uh, please join us for the conversation on September 21st. And here are the distinguished colleagues who are going to join us on that uh, date. And finally, since we talked about eliminating uh, Nazi symbols and uh, what stands behind them, here's my attempt to uh, address that question. You can download it without a charge. So now let me just go back to the panel if I can. And thank you very, very much for taking the time from busy schedule uh, for a very good discussion. And thank you all uh, who joined us for conversation for some excellent comments. And my apologies again to all of you uh, who we could not have a chance uh, to include. I hope to see you next time. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you Sam. all. Thank you to my fellow panelists. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you to everyone. Stage. Thank Take you. Take care.